Hi, and welcome to a Bloomberg event on force and some solutions. Um, from our last presentation, I think you've seen that force are incredibly valuable. And it's been a little scary and also a little inspirational what's happening in our tropical rainforests in terms of solutions and in terms of the problems. But today we have an incredibly distinguished panel to talk about the corporate side of things, what corporations are doing, how they're valuing force now, and some of the solutions that are, that are being uh, put in place. So I just want to in introduce our panel, which is incredibly distinguished. Sophie Beckman is the first chief sustainability officer with International Paper, and she's going to talk a little bit today about how they are addressing uh, and protecting forests. Corey Brinkma is the president of the Forest Stewardship Council, which of course plays an incredibly important role in helping uh, police wood and feeling and forests and products coming from there. Uh, Forest Stewardship Council approval often makes that timber more valuable. Uh, and Lynn Scarlett is the Chief External Officer with the Nature Conservancy. She's worked extensively on these issues, both with TNC and in the government. So we are very lucky to have this group of people together. So uh, from the last panel, I think everyone can agree that forests are valuable. They play an important role. And one of the great transitions for corporate America, I think, in recent years is that forests are not just valuable for their wood, but also standing. So I was hoping we could just start talking about um, where forests stand from corporate accountability in terms of how people have started to get interested in them and um, what ways we're seeing corporations treat forests differently than they might have even five or 10 years ago. Um, Corey, should we start with you? Yeah, ha happy to, uh, to um, kick us off. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Uh, so, you know, I think what we've come to recognize, especially in the last maybe couple of decades here, is that uh, you know, the, the rate that we are uh, using forests for, for forest products and, and using the land underlying forests for, for other purposes, such as uh, agriculture, um, is, is just simply unsustainable. And uh, we've seen in, in many cases around the world, governments stepping up to, uh, to better protect the forests uh, uh, within their boundaries. But I think what's most exciting, again, uh, about the progress over the last couple of decades is, is that the uh, the corporate world, as well as civil society, have come to that recognition themselves and, and realized that, that they need to be doing something about this and making decisions internally, uh, in particular to, to source more responsibly and uh, ensure that the supply chains uh, that they depend on uh, are, are bringing in wood and, and fiber and other forest products uh, coming from lands that have been managed responsibly. Sophie, do you want to talk about that? Why did International uh, Paper decide they needed a sustainability officer, and what is your role there on that front? Yeah, great. Thank, thank you, Leslie, and it's great to be here with Corey and Lynn. So I'm excited about our panel today. Um, so International Paper is one of the largest packaging and paper companies in the world. Um, as such, we are one of the largest fiber buyers in the world, which means our entire business model depends on the sustainability of forests. Um, I think that the way we see this is that the way we transform these renewable resources into products people use every day is by thinking holistically about our value chain. So my job at International Paper includes working with our fiber buyers who are on the ground with landowners every day encouraging uh, sustainable forest management practices. And that value chain continues into our products, which go out to our customers and provide the solutions that people are looking for in the packaging pulp and paper space. Um, I think the shift that, that Corey mentioned, the pivot has really been, how do we think holistically about those forests, not just as um, economic return to the forest landowners, but also for the multiple goods and services that forests provide. And it was mentioned earlier by Carter, whether it's water quality, biodiversity, uh, carbon sequestration, there's a tremendous environmental, uh, economic, and social opportunity coming from forests, and we need to look at them as a whole, um, which is how we're thinking about it uh, within our own uh, context and our, our, fiber, uh, our fiber sourcing, as well as our goals around forest conservation and restoration. So Lynn, a lot of corporations are saying a lot of good things. I mean, 
what do you think? Do you think there's really been a shift in what corporations think, or has there just been a lot of pressure and people have to say the right things? You know, we're seeing an absolutely profound shift. So as Sophie noted, there are many values from forests and certainly carbon sequestration and all the elevated focus on climate solutions um, brings uh, forests into the mix and front and center stage, but water also and clean water, another important realm. And what we are seeing is as companies look at their own carbon footprint and they try to use renewables and they try to reduce their packaging and they try to do all manner of other things to reduce their carbon footprint, they realize it's not enough. And so they're coming to us to invest in forests. Forests store an enormous amount of carbon. Uh, our national forests, for example, the storage of carbon that they uh, present actually is the equivalent of taking 24 million cars off the road. So it's a big deal. Companies are coming to us for that, but they're also coming for water and water quality. Companies like Coca-Cola, for example, work around the world, they need clean water, and lo and behold, it turns out investing in forests helps clean that water and often at a price tag less than using traditional mechanical treatment. So it's the real deal. We're seeing really an exponential increase in interest by corporations to invest in nature. So, so when we talk about investing in forests, Let's be clear, what does that mean? Does that mean we're buying the land and investing it? Does that mean that we're partnering with people who hold it? Does that mean that we're lobbying uh, countries to do a better job like in Brazil and other places? So Corey, do you wanna start us off on that? When we're investing in forests, what yeah, does that mean? Sure, sure, happy to. I, mean, I think what we, we need to recognize that, uh, you know, there are, there are obviously many, many ills facing forests now, from, from deforestation to forest degradation. Um, you know, but the, really the greatest threat that facing forests today is really the root cause of that degradation and deforestation, and it's that we grossly undervalue forests for what they deliver, um, both to the global economy, uh, to human health and well-being. And I mean, I like to think of, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, pun intended, you know, think of Amazon stock back in, uh, you know, year 2000, uh, 20 years ago, you know, it was at about $150 a share. And I think yesterday it closed at something like 3,100. So, so uh, Corey, uh, you know, 20 times its, its value from, what's that? I said, I wish I had invested, it's painful, go on. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So, you know, 20 times its, its value from, from 20 years ago. And, and, and what I, hope certainly 20 years from today is that we recognize, uh, you know, civil society governments and, and most importantly markets uh, recognize that forests are absolutely essential to, to life on earth. And somewhere along that way, we will have monetized them accordingly. You know, we know that forests are the most cost effective way to store carbon. Uh, they are the source of the majority of our clean water um, and, and not to mention their contribution to the livelihoods of, of more than a billion people on earth. And, you know, they deliver in spades, and at some point in the future, we're going to need to recognize that. And I think what, you know, we, it, we're not talking about just simply setting forests aside and, and not being able to touch them. I think what we've recognized, and certainly FSC certification has, has been able to provide a, you know, set, a set of standards and certification system to, to be able to protect those myriad values of the forest while still benefiting from, from the forest products coming off them. But one of the things that we've recognized, uh, and, you know, to really bring this to scale, we do need to deliver additional value, you know, beyond, let's say, the premium that FSC certification might garner in the marketplace. We need to bring in other uh, financial value to those landowners for leaving more trees in the forest, for protecting other high conservation values. And, you know, one of the, I, I think right now, clearly the most promising is, is through uh, uh, monetizing the carbon that they're storing additionally. And ideally down the road, uh, there will be monetization for protecting water quality, biodiversity, and potentially other values. Okay, that's a good point. Sophie, do you want to talk about what it means to invest in forests? Does that mean giving uh, landowners money for the carbon and water that they're protecting? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question with a lot of right responses. I think for international paper, investing in forests really looks like investing in our entire value chain to continue to be able to 
um, buy wood from forest landowners, incentivize them through the market tools that Corey's talking about, whether it's FSC certification or the opportunity for, uh, for carbon credit generation through uh, improved forest management practices on their land. Um, but I think ultimately what we want to what we want to move towards and the direction that the and the opportunity the forest products industry has is to deliver sustainable outcomes through our entire business model. And I think that is really um, the shift that's going to be critical to both incentivizing the forest landowners to improve forest management practices or to enable the policy creation in countries in which there's not large private forest land ownership to be able to drive towards these sustainable forest management outcomes, such as improved carbon sequestration or the improvement of, of water quality or biodiversity um, characteristics of those forests. So I think from, from where I sit uh, and with international paper, if our, if our business model and the development of our, of our renewable fiber-based products can deliver these sustainable outcomes, then it's a, a win for our customers. It's a win for the consumers who, you know, today in particular are so uh, uh, have such a high demand for, let's, let's say, toilet paper in the last six months. And it's also a win for those forest landowners who continue, continue to have a reason to keep those forests as, quote, working forests where they're providing those multiple goods and services. Lynn, do you have thoughts on what it means to invest in a forest? I still think I'm not entirely clear. Does it mean that we pay people to keep their trees up and to protect water? So it means a whole spectrum of things. And at the Nature Conservancy, we engage in all of them. So, uh, for example, we have a 250,000 acre project in partnership with some uh, other entities uh, where the property was acquired. We are then advising and helping on improved forest management so that there will be sustainable timber projects. That's one part of the picture, but also preparing those lands to actually provide carbon credits through the storage of carbon in those trees, for example. But another example, in the United States, a large amount of private forests are actually owned by small landowners, that is, less than 5,000 acres. Many of them don't have the resources to invest in preparing their forests to be able to sell forest carbon into the marketplace. And so invest in that case means a partnership like what we're doing with Amazon, for example, to actually help provide the technical expertise and some of the upfront investment to change the management practices so that those, uh, those landowners can then participate in the sale of forced carbon into the marketplace. It means a whole lot of things. We also do uh, work, like Corey said, on supply chains, so work with companies that buy goods from, let's say, Latin America, from the Amazon. And there we want to avoid deforestation. So there, investment means how do you invest in agricultural practices that help to avoid deforestation, for example. But if you engage in agroforestry, have some trees in the mix, you can also have forced carbon to kind of sell into the marketplace as well. So it's a whole spectrum of things. Buy land and protect improve land management through different techniques and invest in those, um, and then help build the marketplace so that carbon markets can flourish. So, so to Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add, I think Lynn teed up so well that the other component of investment from the corporate angle is really on how we partner with strategic partners and international paper works with both FSC and the Nature Conservancy um, investing in strategic partnerships that can scale up all of this work. And so in that context, investment really looks like, okay, what can we do together to accelerate uh, the concepts of improved forest management or conservation or restoration? And what's the ultimate impact that we can have on the ground? And I think when we think of forest investment, we think of it through both our sourcing and our value chain, but we also think of it through what do our partnerships look like and where can we go together? And I think it's notable that 10 years ago, that would not have been the case. The forest products industry and others from um, you know, NG, the NGO community were not that excited about partnering. And now that we've shifted, I think we're able to achieve a lot more. So one of the questions uh, I sort of have is, and I think that a lot of people who look at 
force sort of a you know four stamps of approval is how accurate are they how are you able to really get in and monitor what's happening in these very big places and give them so Corey, you give uh you give your your approval to people who are supposedly doing legitimate uh and sustainable forestry but you've been caught a couple times in in perhaps you know approving forests like in russia that turned out not to be completely sustainable so the question is how do you really with such a, a big amounts of land and across so many countries, how are you really uh, enforcing these principles of sustainability? Right, that's a great question. I mean, yeah, we, we uh, I mean, any any standard and certification system will will have its gaps, and and as we have grown, as we've gone to scale, I think FSC now is a little over uh, 500 uh, million acres certified around the world, I think in some 80 countries, that um, there, there are going to be some, some bad actors that, that uh, try to uh, skirt some of the rules. And you know, I think there are, the underlying uh, uh, model of, of uh, FSC certification is, is very sound. I and mean, we, we have convened the, uh, really the world's most respected uh, stakeholders, global uh, conservation groups like the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, Greenpeace, and others, uh, as well as social interests and, and progressive companies to essentially define um, those values that should be protected while we benefit from uh, the harvest of forest products. And what we've also done, the core to that model also is, is independent um, auditing. So, you know, much like financial auditing, uh, uh, we set the standards, but um, independent auditors are, are the ones actually verifying uh, conformance on the ground. And uh, there are certainly uh, um, areas where there, you know, there are shades of gray, um, where uh, laws, um, which is part, you know, obeying laws is, is part of our standard, and sometimes they conflict with uh, other requirements in the standard, and, and we've definitely uh, learn some lessons from uh, from some of those challenges. I, I think that our honestly our greatest challenge right now is uh, is the success that we've had in the marketplace is is bringing folks out of the woodwork in in places where uh, let's say fraud is a little more commonly practiced and uh, you know, <laughs> they they're, they want to get in on the game and and we need to. Uh, we really need to be able to use, uh, you know, the latest technologies. Blockchain is 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 uh, uh, a format that we are really um, investigating seriously to uh, understand how it might be able to be brought into our chain of custody auditing procedure, essentially on a uh, transaction by transaction basis, uh, to be able to weed out fraud in the system. I think that's where you know go forward, uh, uh, where we are probably going to be the most challenged, but. Uh, we're learning. Yeah. Uh, we're we're obviously a large global organization, and and uh, uh, we think we're on the right right path. So Sophie, you can maybe take that up. We did get an audience audience question that is also about technology. So I'll I'll relate to blockchain. But they asked like new tech tools like UVA and laser scanning soil sensors. So if you could sort of work in how tech technology might be part of the auditing process. Sure. I, I mean, I think really we have to start with a fundamental question, which is um, if you if you don't know where your wood is coming from, you really can't do anything about your supply chain. So the, the starting point for all of this, whether it's towards certification um, or using other technologies, which I will speak to, is really about transparency in your supply chain, knowing where your wood is coming from and getting closer to the forest management to be able to ask those really critical questions about whether or not there's um, degradation or or good forest management, sustainable forest management and conservation going on. Um, in the last year, International Paper has developed a GIS based tool, which is essentially a mapping tool that our fiber buyers have on their phone as an app. When they go out to uh, to have an opportunity to buy some some timber, they're able to leverage this app, which includes several layers of information about the forest type, the potential occurrence of rare, th threatened, or endangered species, the, the um, contiguousness, the species richness. It has a tremendous amount of data in it that the fiber buyer can look to to verify whether or not 
that fiber in question would meet international papers requirements for responsible fiber purchasing. Now, the, the opportunity with this kind of tool is to get at what Lynn was saying, which is we buy from 90% of our fiber in the US comes from small private forest land owners. When we can use this tool, it invites a conversation with those forest land owners about what kind of management approaches they're using on their land and how we can support them with the technical resources to be able to um, to enhance those management approaches prior to harvest. And I think that's a critical uh, point of intervention because it gives us an opportunity to engage with landowners who by and large really want to do the right thing. They want to make sure that that charismatic creature or that lovely migratory songbird is present in their forest landscape and those objectives can be accomplished. So this is an opportunity for us to take on board this new technology, put it in the hands of our fiber buyers and allow them to deploy it. I wouldn't um, say to the, to the audience uh, that the question came in about precision forestry, it's probably not quite falling in the category of precision forestry, but it does fall into the category of being able to improve forest management uh, through an intervention um, and providing outreach to landowners. So that's the, the direction we're taking it. And that's a complement to our work with certified supply chains. So with FSC certified supply chains and with our own FSC certified group of forest landowners, which we're also supporting. So we see these as complementary. They're both advancing conservation, conservation outcomes through our purchase of that fiber. And I just want to ask a quick follow-up question. Where does the information that goes into this app come from? Great question. Um, really several sources, publicly available data that comes from U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Geological Service, but we're also starting to layer in new data. For example, we use some of the Nature Conservancy's data on longleaf pine habitat and on presence of swallowtail kites, which are a very special rare kind of bird that have a specific habitat range. And we are starting to um, explore new areas in which we could include data that's credible, verified, and been produced um, by a partner who has a, a reputation for really robust um, data development. So Lynn, that brings us to you and the role of technology and all of this. But I think Sophie also raises another point, which is even if you have all the information, are the forest owners able to do the sustainable practices that they want? Do they have the support and money and know-how to get there anyway? Yes, so I do want to amplify the point that uh, emerging technologies for monitoring and verification are very important because that is uh, critical. That is, we want to not just sell something but verify that the carbon really is there and that it's enduring. And one of the challenges is that traditional ways of doing that are somewhat costly. So these new technologies are, are very helpful. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, the technology is important. It's important for measuring and verifying and so forth. But what we find is, particularly for smaller landowners in the U.S., uh, there are some upfront costs to changing your practices for how you're actually managing your forest to position it uh, to meet certain standards or certifications and or to play into the carbon market, for example. And so, as I mentioned earlier, our partnership with Amazon, looking at that barrier to participation, has been one in which we are going in and working with those landowners, paying for those upfront costs, to position them then to be able thereafter to participate through sustainable practices and practices that meet um, the requirements for participating in the carbon market. So there are some upfront costs where that investment uh, can, can be really catalytic. You know, there's something else we have not mentioned, which is if you're a corporate buyer, you want to buy carbon credits, let's just say, you do not want to engage in 10,000 transactions with 10,000 landowners who each own 50 or 100 or 200 acres. And so another role for an organization like the Nature Conservancy is uh, sort of as an aggregator. So we're working in the Northeast, having helped create something called a carbon co-op. And all these smaller landowners then participate in the co-op, uh, use certain management practices, and then the buyer can buy the carbon credits from that co-op, kind of one-stop shop. So there are all kinds of enabling conditions 
that a nonprofit organization like the Conservancy can play a catalytic role in, in uh, supporting. I love that. I hadn't heard of the carbon co-op, so that's fabulous. So we're, look, we're getting to the last five minutes of the panel, and um, a lot of what's happening with forests can be very discouraging, but I think what I like about this panel is we've, we've given some nice solutions. If all of you sort of wanted to take one minute to say, of all the things you've seen, what, what's interesting about this panel is you all work across multiple forests and multiple owners and really have a wide range of knowledge of what's out there. If you sort of wanted to leave uh, our viewers with like the one favorite you have, whether it's the carbon co-op or whatever it is in terms of technologies or practices that you'd like to see expand, I'd love to hear from you. Corey, do you want to start? Or am I putting you on the spot? Sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> no problem, Leslie, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure, uh, uh, within the certification realm, I mean, the, the commitments by major forest products producers uh, is, is, a, is a huge sign of, of hope for us from Kimberly Clark and Procter & Gamble, uh, Sophie's Company, International Paper, Ikea, Williams-Sonoma, Tetra Pak. Uh, uh, you know, many of the world's largest producers have appreciated that, uh, you know, a bit of attention and investment into, into sustainable supply chains is an investment in their future and bolsters their credibility with consumers. But honestly, right now, the, the, the greatest sign of hope for me, and we've talked a little bit around this, is the, the flood of pledges and commitments uh, of carbon neutrality by major corporations. I mean, literally just at the beginning of this year, you know, we had Larry Fink from BlackRock uh, commit to, uh, you know, including climate and climate change in their due diligence go forward. We had Microsoft, Amazon, Ikea, and, and even companies that depend on uh, fossil fuels like British Petroleum and Delta Airlines commit to neutrality in the next 10 to 20 years. And uh, there is no way that those commitments will, will, will be realized without substantive investment in the storage of carbon in forests. And so uh, we, uh, we believe that, that forests are, uh, will be vital for that investment. And the, the wonderful thing is that so many of those other myriad values uh, uh, will be protected along the way. Sophie, in terms of things you're seeing out there in the many forests and forest managers you work for, is there any particular technology or any particular program that really speaks to you? you know, I, I think I have to, um, to add on to what Corey has said. I think that if we, if we start with the, the forest landowners and those who manage forests, there are an increasing number of incentives and tools that they can use to improve forest management and also to deliver the outcome for themselves um, that they're really looking for, whether it's in the social, economic, or environmental space. You know, I think there's a huge potential to, uh, to really be more comprehensive about decarbonization through natural climate solutions, which start in the forest. But ultimately, I'm really inspired by what's going on around us to think about our whole value chain. And we haven't talked at all about sort of circularity and renewable solutions on this call, but this the, the forest stewardship piece of it is the starting point to the circularity of our products, of our fiber-based products, and it really translates throughout the value chain with opportunities for decarbonization at the forest level, um, for uh, ambitious targets around greenhouse gas reductions. Us, we're looking at a 35% reduction in the next 10 years of our greenhouse gases from our manufacturing, and then through our products, these really, um, you know, fantastic, uh, fiber-based packaging, pulp, and, and paper going out to our customers. So I think what I'm thinking about right now is rather than just siloing, well, we're going to focus on the forest or we're going to focus on our manufacturing, how do we get really holistic about the whole value chain and think about it in terms of circular solutions that really deliver win-wins for everybody in the equation? So Lynn, we're down to just one minute. Just if I'm a lay person and I want to make sure I'm participating in these wonderful changes, what should I do? Oh golly, uh, I was going to I was going to add to what everyone else said, which is that climate is one of our biggest challenges uh, that we face, and we have in nature a solution that's hidden in plain sight. Uh, our research has shown that nature, not just forests, but wetlands and even soil health, can generate about one third of the emission reductions needed by 2030 to get us on the right pathway. Forests are at the head of the pack, reforestation at the head of the pack, 
So I guess if I were looking to um, both the companies out there as well as citizens uh, doing everything, whether it's politically, whether it's in corporate engagement and investments, to invest in reforestation, improved forest management, um, and protecting forests is the way to go. So Lynn, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna stop you all. We're we're really down at the end. Thank you all for participating in this panel and shedding light on this very important issue. Uh, keep up all your good work and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie.